Hello and welcome to the Football Outsiders Week 3 Preview Show. I'm Ian O'Connor, Senior Data Analyst at Football Outsiders. Joining me as always is Tom Strachan, Football Outsiders Fantasy Analyst. On today's show, we'll be covering all things betting and fantasy for all of the Sunday games as well as the single Monday Night Football game this week. Before we dive into things, just want to ask Tom, how did things go for you last week uh, fantasy-wise? Yeah, it was a good week. I think like I was going through my leagues and uh, I won 13 of my leagues, but lost in my home league, which, you know, that's the one that always counts. Lost in the Scott Fish Bowl, so that was annoying, but I had a profitable week of DFS. Would have been a much better week if the Ravens had held on to that lead, but uh, yeah, you know, you can't have everything, can you? How about you? Absolutely. I did did pretty well. My home league, I did win. Uh, really have a, a solid team there. Got the most points to to blow out victories so far. So feeling pretty good there. I mentioned to you on the Thursday night show, that our preview that we did, I won my single DFS. i trying to get more into DFS, but uh, over the years have not done too well because I haven't really known too much about it. But uh, as we do this more, really getting a lot more into it. But won like eight bucks on, a, I think, a, a $5 entry. So not so bad there. Like you said, profit's always good. So but it wasn't a bad week overall. I enjoyed watching the games and watching my players score a lot of points. And and speaking of fantasy, you guys out there watching, you play on fantasy, Underdog Fantasy with us, and you can double your first deposit up to $100 using promo code OUTSIDERS. Now, even with the NFL best ball season over, which Underdog is very well known for, they do have other user-friendly game formats to spice up all the games for you. You can try their Battle Royale, which is a six-round best ball style draft in season with simpler chances to win than your traditional daily fantasy sports sites that we were just talking about. We were going up against hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of other people. You can also try their Pick'em games, where you can wager on players' chances to go higher or lower than their projected stat lines. You can pick up to five, and it went up to uh, 20 times your money, I believe, there. We did one, Mike Tanier and I did on our Monday show. Uh, I got four out of five, but I went with the insurance that time just to see and won two and a half times by getting four out of five. So a lot of fun there, and you can do that even in states where traditional prop betting Currently is not available. Underdog is the fastest growing fantasy site around, so join the fun over at underdogfantasy.com, or you can download the app, the Underdog app in the App Store. Be sure to use promo code OUTSIDERS now to get a free $100. So we'll dive right into the Sunday action, starting with a, would say a big one. One of these teams has fared pretty well so far this year. The other one is having a lot of struggles, and that's Kansas City minus five and a half at Indianapolis. This kind of maybe surprisingly has a high total at 50 and a half. I think driven a lot more by Kansas City uh, than is Indianapolis. But, I mean, they've got to get things going at some point, I would think. They'll have their they'll cut their couple receivers back, uh, it seems like, in Michael Pittman and Alec Pierce potentially this weekend. But right now things are not good. They take on the 2-0 and Chiefs. Jonathan Taylor limited to just nine carries. Though so he gained 54 yards, but that entire Colts offense was held off the scoreboard. Now, the Kansas City defense has been just average so far. So – uh, the Colts should be able to find some success for fantasy purposes, right? Yeah, you'd like to think so. I mean, Jonathan Taylor last week, but particularly it was like the first half usage. I believe he had like sort of like 15 yards or something ridiculous in the first half. And the Colts just have to be able to get him going because if he's not working out, particularly on a week like last week where they had, you know, Joe Randoms playing receiver, <laughs> it's just not going to work for them. So even if it's just Alec Pierce who makes it back, not just if Michael Pittman's unable to go, then I'd feel slightly better about them. But for me, the only players that I'd consider playing in this matchup would be Jonathan Taylor, Michael Pittman, maybe Alec Pierce, and then Naeem Hines in deeper leagues because he's still been getting targeted quite often. He had 11 targets, which is for the third most on the team. And he's had a couple of red zone carries and one carry inside the five. So it hasn't happened for him just yet, but there's still potential that it can. But, I mean, it's just the other side of this game, isn't it? It's like it's all the Chiefs there. I think I'm really expecting big bounce backs from Marcus Velda, Scantling and Juju Smith-Schuster. I mean, they had a really difficult week last week against the Chargers, combining for 7.4 PPR points. But Smith-Schuster was running from the slot a lot and being you know, up against Bryce Callahan, who's a really good slot receive, uh, slot cornerback, and he'd shut down Hunter Renfro the week before, so perhaps we should have seen that come in. But, you know, Mahomes has gone up against Gus Bradley a number of times as defensive coordinator on the, the Colts. He's previously been at the Chargers and the Raiders, and he doesn't like to really change the way he plays. And I think it was Warren Sharp of Sharp Football had the stat, but so far Mahomes has faced good Bradley, Gus Bradley, 
seven occasions and thrown 17 touchdowns to two interceptions. So I'm really expecting the pass catchers on the Chiefs to bounce back. Yeah, especially, you know, Travis Kelsey limited to just five for 51 last Thursday, which was uh, great for me because I played against him in that home league I was talking about. <laughs> still t- it's tied for the most targets. It's still the number one. But does Mahomes kind of spreading the ball around a little bit more give you any pause on paying up for him in some of those daily leagues? You know, in season long, you're not sitting him at all unless he's hurt. But as far as your daily leagues, how's that go? I'm fine with playing him this week. I think uh, this week in particular, there's an awful lot of the real top tier quarterbacks on the slate. So, whereas it previously last week it was quite difficult. You had Lamar Jackson and you had Kyler Murray. So you either really went with them or you went with a player who had no rushing upside. But this week, I'll just run through them. You've got Josh Allen at 8,200, Lamar Jackson, 8,000, Patrick Mahomes, 7,900, Jalen Hurts, 7,600, Justin Herbert, 7,400, Kyler Murray, 7,300. And then it goes down. Like You've got Joe Burrow. So there's loads of options. But it, from a pure DFS perspective, when you get slates like this, the ownership gets spread out quite a lot, which means that if you play Mahomes, you're part of a smaller number of people doing so, which can then, you know, if Mahomes is the kind of ceiling games we've seen him have, then you could have huge leverage on the field and it makes it easier to win. So I'd be very much open to stacking him up heavily this weekend. Yeah, you can't really – it's hard to bet against him uh, yeah. in Mahomes. He, he doesn't stay quiet very often, so not too surprising there. Now, as far as the betting angle of this, I, I can't – I don't know if I can bet on Indy until they prove they know how to actually play football again. There really isn't much to think about here for me. Kansas City, I think, wins and covers. Indianapolis defense slightly below average despite the poor showing last week. But Kansas City, I think, puts up a lot of points. I think the over hits, again, this one is one of the higher totals at 50 and a half. Um, I do think the Colts come out and, and are able to score a little bit of points and push that over. But Kansas City scores a lot. What, what, what do you think there? Yeah, I, I saw Kansas City favoured by six, and that just seems like a layup here. You know, they could even if the Colts come out and are more competent than they've been over the last two weeks, and you know, because of the nature of the game, they're pushed to score more. I, you know, I feel like the Chiefs could easily be 10, 15 points ahead of them at any given point. So I'm not sure I'd quite go with the over if it's creeping into the 50s. Probably, you know, you could see this being sort of like in the low 30s for the Chiefs and the low teens for the Colts, perhaps. Uh, but, yeah, it's betting on the Colts right now just isn't a great idea. Yeah, and, and it's probably not surprising to all out there, this is uh, Football Outsider's second highest confidence money line pick this week. Just behind? Well, I can't give that away. But you all can get those picks and all of our NFL picks every week with an FO Plus subscription. Sign up for just $4.99 a month at footballoutsiders.com. Slash subscribe to get those NFL picks as well as premium articles, stats, fantasy advice, and an ad-free experience. So do not forget to get that uh, and get all of pretty much everything that we've got you can, can get with that subscription. So we'll move on to a pretty boring game uh, going from Kansas City and Indy to Houston plus two and a half at Chicago. 40 point total. Really an ugly game all around. I don't think there's a lot to cover here. Uh, both offenses are 26th or worse so far. Houston defense is 16th. Chicago is only 27th. Are there any plays that, that you like in this one? Well, the, and this is an unusual one for me because I'm a bit of a known David Montgomery hater, but I think it's hard to deny that at the minute the team still favors him over Khalil Herbert. Over the first two games of the season, he's at a 72.5% opportunity share, which is really quite big. And Herbert's been more efficient on his carries, but the Bears just aren't in the mood to move away from David Montgomery yet. So I would be quite happy playing David Montgomery. Uh, I think, you know, you can definitely rush on the Texans. That's no problem there. And on the other side of the ball, I'd also be fine playing Damian Pierce. I wouldn't play them both in the same lineup because the likelihood is if they're both accumulating lots of runs, then it's going to slow the game pace down and it's difficult for both to hit their ceilings. But Damian Pierce, you know, his opportunity to share jumped from 35% to 84% last week. And the, uh, 
And the Bears, you know, they didn't put up much resilience to the Packers, who ran all over them on Sunday night football. So I'd be completely fine with either of those running backs. But outside of that, I mean, Cole Komet and Darnell Mooney have combined for seven targets for two receptions and four yards. It's like nobody wants a piece of that. Yeah, and David Montgomery had a really good game against Green Bay last week running the ball. The Bears, those guys you just mentioned, I mean, they really need to get those guys going. They need to throw the ball more in general. They've got the fewest attempts, completions, and yards. I think like 15 of 28. Uh, but like I said, this may not be the game against – Houston's got a 20, 25th ranked rush defense. Um, they're only average against the pass. So it could be a good game to get him going, but also think they're going to run the ball a lot. And I like Chicago to cover barely. And I like the under, it's 40 and a half points, but with these offenses, I don't really see a lot of scoring happening uh, in this game. And like you said, but it, you know, having both running backs going, getting a lot of runs, Davis Mills, I know you mentioned to me uh, earlier, has just not been playing well at all. So I don't see a lot of points in this one. Yeah, same. I, I'd take the Chicago side of things. I think, you know, particularly with them being at home, it just leaned just slightly more with them and, Davis Mills and the Texans just haven't got anything going yet. So, yeah, agreed with you on that. Yep. Like I said, not much to cover there. Pretty, a pretty quick quick preview on that one. Move on to Baltimore minus three at New England. 43-and-a-half point total. Obviously, Baltimore had the disappointing loss last week. You mentioned huge game from Lamar, though. Baltimore is the top offense in DVOA, surprisingly driven by the number one pass offense. They actually have the worst rush offense DVOA. Noah running back averaging more than 20 yards per game. Uh, Lamar you know, has pretty much been all of the rushing offense with that big 79-yard touchdown run last week. Who are your top plays from this game? Yeah, it's not a game I'll be aggressive on because being a Ravens fan, I know there's been some messy encounters up in New England over the years, and it just – it doesn't feel like this one has the potential to turn into a shootout because I'm not sure that the Patriots can push the Ravens in the same way that the Dolphins just let loose on them last week. I really don't think that the Patriots receiving options are capable of doing that. Uh, I'd be fine starting Damian Harris. I think he's a good play. He seems to still have the leg up on Ramondre Stevenson for the time being in that backfield. I'd I think you've got to start Lamar and Mark Andrews. You know, you don't draft studs to sit them by week three, particularly when they've been playing well. And then Rashad Bateman on DraftKings is still just 5,700. And, you know, we've seen him in back-to-back -back weeks of long touchdowns. Yeah. Last week, he got to the point where you get the 100-yard bonus of three extra points, which can be really, you know, that can create huge leverage on players around that price point. So I'd be fine playing Lamar, plus one of either Andrews and Bateman. I'm just not sure I'd heavily game stack it this week. Yeah. And speaking of that game last week, we both got burned by the Dolphins once again against the Ravens this year, like we talked about last week. Baltimore absolutely cruising to the cover through three quarters. I'm going to double down on them this week, say they cover pretty easily against New England. Um, the Baltimore defense was pretty good before that fourth quarter. New England obviously doesn't have Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell. And that defense has been solid just outside the top ten. But I like Baltimore to cover. Again, it's only at three points. Um, I think they win by more than that. And I'm going to go with the under again here, too, 43 and a half. Uh, I don't think – you know, I think New England slows them down a little bit defensively, um, but not sure that they, they put up the points against Baltimore to be able to get this one over. Yeah, I think I'd lean with the under as well. Um, but I'll, I'll also say that I think the Ravens will cover. I think the defense is going to be stronger this week. It sounds like Marlon Humphrey and Marcus Peters are both feeling better. J.K. Dobbins looks set to make his season debut and Ronnie Stanley might even play. So they would be huge, huge additions to the Ravens if they're all feeling healthy this week. Yeah, all in on the Ravens. Uh, as they, like you just said, get get healthier there. And uh, not a whole lot of confidence in the Patriots. But keep it going. Moving on to another one team in the AFC East we've got, and then uh, an AFC North matchup. Cincinnati minus five at New York Jets, a 45-point total. Now, that Bengals offense continues to struggle. They're last in the league in offense. They're 29th in both the pass and the rush. But I see a big performance coming this week against that last-place Jets defense. Last against the pass, 21st against the rush. Now, I'm expecting a big game from Joe Mixon, who's gotten off to a, I guess you could say a slow start, hasn't gotten into the end zone yet, um, had over 20 points, I think, in PPR week one. He had a lot of receiving yards. What are you expecting? Are you all, or are you also expecting a, a big performance from Mixon? I know there's going to be a lot to go around in this game, I think. 
Yeah, and I think Mixon's going to be the kind of player that if you play in um, daily fantasy cash or double up contests, he'll be popular in those because, you know, he came off a good performance last week and it really does seem like the Bengals are kind of going to use him healthily. They're not trying to force Samaji P. Ryan or Chris Evans into the game plan. So I'd be very much fine playing Joe Mixon. I think the in terms of the passing attack, the player who stands out to me is T. Higgins. He's just 6,100. And uh, notably, uh, yeah, last week, you know, he came back from a concussion. And sometimes you see people sort of shy away from players when they're coming back from injury. But concussion is one of those situations you should never worry about because they've cleared the protocol. Mm -hmm. And he went uh, 10 for 6 and 71 and a touchdown on the Cowboys. So I'd be very much happy playing him. And also the Jets rank 31st in DVOA against wide receiver twos. So it really seems like the wide receiver twos so far have been having their best weeks against the Jets. So T Higgins, stack him up with Burroughs. I think that'd be fine. Or play the run side of things instead. Yeah, and one more point I want to make. Uh, I was talking about Joe Mixon there. Uh, his receiving yard line is set at just 19 and a half yards. Uh, that's one that I really like this week. He's He went 63 and 26 in the first two games. The Jets are 29th defending passes to running back so far. And Nick Chubb had 26 last week. Kareem Hunt had 16. So uh, Hunt didn't hit that number. Chubb did. I like like him to uh, go over that 19 and a half pretty easily this week. And that defense first receiver stat is one uh, for you all that you can get with an FO plus subscription again at footballoutsiders.com slash subscribe. So looking at the other end or other side of this one, Garrett Wilson, obviously was probably the top waiver wire ad this week, had a 33% target share last week, team high 22% now on the season has had eight red zone targets. I think all last week, which is now two more than anyone else in the league. Can he follow up that big performance this week? And then, what about Elijah Moore? Yeah, I, I don't mind the Garrett Wilson play. I think, you know, when, when a player's on a hot streak, it's very difficult to turn away from them. What I will say was that he lined up on the outside just for 16 snaps and he was targeted on 10 of them. And obviously that can sometimes provide big high-value targets when you're playing on the perimeter. That kind of efficiency was something which probably is going to drop off a little bit, but... If Joe Flacco is comfortable targeting him heavily and is starting to rely on him, then by all means, go back to the well on it. Elijah Moore, I think people will probably be a little bit down on him because Garrett Wilson's attracted all the headlines this week. So he's definitely not a play that I would be shying away from. I don't think there's anything about the Bengals' defense that makes me nervous about him. He's 5,000 on DraftKings, uh, which is 400 cheaper than uh, Garrett Wilson. So maybe people end up sort of leaning towards Elijah Moore because of the savings. But I think both of them are fine plays if you are playing either Joe Mixon or the Bengals pass it as uh, bring backs so that you're getting more access to any points in that game. And uh, the, these two teams played each other last year, and the Bengals lost this game partially on a very bad call. I don't know if it was at the end of fourth quarter or overtime. I don't remember if they went to overtime or not, but a, a really bad and unnecessary roughness or targeting helmet to helmet, whatever they call it in, in the NFL. Um, but I think the Bengals, I, I, it, this is more of a gut feeling, I think, but I think they get it together and have a big game. They've got too much talent to be as bad as they have been. Uh, the offensive line needs to be a lot better and protect Burrow. Obviously, he's been been sacked a lot the first couple of weeks. I'm not going to predict a 50-point output, but I think they could score a lot in this week. And the Jets are 10th lowest in defensive adjusted sack rate. Uh, that stat also from uh, you can get with an FO Plus subscription, but, you know, haven't been great uh Get it, you know, getting to the quarterback in that regard. So I think you know the Bengals put up a lot of points. They cover, and I think the they put up enough, and the Jets get a, enough points that this one goes over that forty-five point total. Yeah, I think, like you said, I mean, Joe Burrow's been sacked so much, and it just feels like the Bengals really want to come out and put on a show. I mean, his completion rate has dropped from sixty down to sixty-four percent, whereas last year it was at seventy point six percent. So it's really noticeable how poorly they've been playing compared to last year or at least the back end of last year uh, I'm going to go with the Bengals to cover here and I'll go over I saw it at 45 and I'd be completely fine taking it around that range I think you know the Bengals can rack up rack up the high end of the 20s easy enough and uh, let the Jets do the rest yeah it could be a big game for the Bengals could be a new Broadway Joe in town after this one uh, with Joe Burrow heading back to Cincinnati after the game <laughs> But here, a big one, too, I think, for not only for 
the teams being an NFC East uh, rivalry, but also Carson Wentz facing his old team, the team that drafted in Philadelphia, six and a half point favorites going into Washington. Philly dominant on Monday night against Minnesota, looking like the best team in the league possibly. I mean, was that a good Philly team or primetime Kirk Cousins? I'd say more so good Philadelphia. Um, could be a little of both, but now I said Carson Wentz facing his old team. I think this morning on the, the scroll bar during uh, Good Morning Football saw quarterbacks like 5-10 and 10 against teams that drafted them. I don't know if that's within a time frame, a certain time frame or something, but something just that, that stuck out to me when I was watching that. But Carson Wentz seems like has been spreading the ball around the first few weeks, but everyone is producing. Uh, I know Jahan Dotson, I think his – his production is unsustainable based I think he's got three touchdowns and like nine targets total. Uh, so that that's not really sustainable. But how do you go about choosing which receivers to play among Terry McLaurin, Curtis Samuel, and Jahan Dotson? And then on the Thursday night preview, we mentioned Logan Thomas as well, tight end. Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky scenario because obviously Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson see some quite high value targets and they're the ones that – really can change a slate. Um, but like you say, Dotson, I mean, he's first in DVOA amongst wide receivers at the minute. So it really feels like that's possibly a little more than it should be. I think it's very easy to default back to Curtis Samuel, who, you know, he's seen more targets than either of those two players. Only four receivers in the NFL have seen more than Samuel's 15. It seems like Carson Wentz has developed a, a rapport with him and he's not afraid to just dink and dunk down to him whilst Dotson and McLaurin have to fight out on the perimeters or in the trickier areas. Samuel's being very much used like, kind of like he was in Carolina before he left, where he was just right around the line of scrimmage and being schemed into those plays. Uh, so, yeah, I think Curtis Samuel's definitely a player who will be popular this week. I think you can probably even play him in cash games or double-ups. I think it wouldn't be surprising to see 10 to 15% of the field play him. In terms of the other two, I think Jahan Dotson's only 4600 and that price is really interesting when it's – it's 1800 cheaper than Terry McLaurin. And if his game turns into a shootout as you know, it's possible, I mean, both teams have been putting up points, then you'd imagine that Dotson has every chance to get there as well. So I think Terry McLaurin's a little more expensive than I'd like to pay for him, given how much competition he's seeing from Jahan Dotson. And you mentioned a potential shootout or going against uh, or Phillies going against that 28th ranked Washington defense. Um, I imagine some Eagles stacks will be pretty popular this week as well, whether it be uh, A.J. Brown and Jalen Hurts. We saw Devontae Smith have a big game last week, which is uh, something Mike Mike Tanner and I talked about Monday because he didn't get a lot of work, really. The first, he was shut out the first week, didn't get a ton. Uh, or then going into week two, they you know made a priority to get him the ball. Um, how are you feeling about those, those guys uh, this week, again, against a, a defense that are expected to put up quite a few points? Yeah, I think – for me, like going back to what you said, you know, from the very first snap, the Eagles were targeting Devonta Smith and, you know, he'd went on to leave the team in snaps, routes run and receiving yards. And people were kind of off him a little bit because of the zero in week one, which zeros are always hard to take. But when you've got elite talent and it's a former Heisman winner, then you've just got to keep going back to it. So I'd be very much happy to play Devonta Smith again. I mean, AJ Brown had a little bit of a down week by his standards and because there's so many top tier players on this slate, I don't expect an awful lot of people will be playing him. I think eight, I think Jalen Hurt is going to be very popular because the commanders aren't a great team who are good at defending the run. So I would expect to see a lot of people play Jalen Hurts, but not an awful lot of people stack him up with either AJ Brown or Devonta Smith. And as such in tournaments, I'd be more than happy to do that. Yeah, Jalen Hurts has just looked unstoppable. The whole offense really has looked unstoppable at times. They'll be against two below-average NFC North defenses, but still uh, putting up a lot of points and looking very good. Both sides of the ball are top 10 in DVOA. We've got this line uh, with FO almost two points higher than the market. Um, so I like Philly to cover, and I think Wentz and in in, uh, Washington – Put up enough to push this one over as well. You made a potential shootout there. I think it does hit that uh, over, what's the last, was it 47 points, which I would kind of think this would be up there with some of those that are close to, close to 50, but a little bit higher than that. So I'll take the over on this one. 
Yeah, I'll take the over and I'll take the Eagles to cover. I do think this commander's team's frisky, but I think what we saw from the Eagles on Monday night against the Vikings, you know, they're just will ready to go out there and dominate. I mean, Darius Slade seemed to be ready to try and pick off almost every pass from uh, Kirk Cousins. And if there's one thing that you feel like the Eagles defenders would like to do, it's definitely picking off Carson Wentz. Yeah, and that, you know, we saw Washington go down big early last week and come back, score a lot of points there to, uh, in the second half, uh, kind of make a comeback. Uh, Philadelphia or Detroit did that to Philadelphia. So I could see Philly getting up big early and Washington, like you said, feisty team putting up, uh, throwing the ball a ton, just kind of going YOLO at that point, uh, trying to come back and definitely could see this one going over as well. So moving on to Las Vegas at Tennessee. The Raiders are minus two. This is a 45 and a half point total. Uh, not a great week for these two teams last year. That embarrassing collapse for Las Vegas, embarrassing blowout for Tennessee. Most of us here at, at Football Outsiders, I think we're lower than consensus on Derrick Henry, but I don't know if any of us really expected struggles like this. He's got 34 carries, only 107 yards. Is he playable against just an average Las Vegas run defense to you? I'm calling Derrick Henry my fade of the week because okay. it was – it was striking watching that game and just how poor he is. And we have seen some of these top defenses who've run into the Titans a few times really work out ways to come after Derrick Henry and prevent him from going ham on them. But like you look at virtually every stat with Derrick Henry and it just seems really bad. Like He leads the league in rushing yards below expectation with 46 rushing yards below expectation, which, I mean, there's a lot of bad running backs there, but he's managing to see even more than them. Uh, last year, you know, the argument coming into this year was, well, if Derrick Henry, even if his efficiency continues to drop off a little bit, if he sees the number of receptions he was getting last year, which was averaging around three per game, then he's still got the capacity to be a real top tier running back. But he's seen one target through two games so far. So until I see otherwise, particularly given how expensive Derrick Henry can be, I'm just not playing him anywhere. Yeah, and that, on the other side, that Tennessee defense really isn't good either. It's pretty bad so far. Um, could we see Derek Carr and Devontae Adams have a, a Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs like game this Sunday? I know impossible, or it's really hard to predict three touchdowns, obviously, from a receiver. But it seems like they've got that connection as well, and, and it could be in for a big day. Yeah, and I'm also planting a flag here and saying that my stack of the week will be Derek Carr and Devante Adams. Last week, they were incredibly popular in DFS. Devante Adams was 40% rostered in a lot of the top tournaments, which just means that when, when a player fails, the 60% of people who didn't play Devante Adams are in a much better situation. And he because started of off that, great. He had a touchdown, I think, on the first drive. Did he, did he have a touchdown? Yeah, it was, and then it all kind of went very quiet yeah, after it was that. Very early. So, but the projections I've seen so far reckon that his ownership this week could be below 8%, below sort of 7% or so. And we, we know what he's capable of. That first week was particularly impressive. And I just, you know, after seeing the Titans capitulate, I'm, I'm feeling like Raiders are going to be frisky here. And I'd be happy adding Darren Waller onto that stack as well. He's 5,800. We've seen him kind of getting those red zone looks. And if you're looking for a player on the other side of the ball, Traylon Burks at 4,900. He's not seen that every down workload yet that we'd like for him, but he seems to be involved when he is on the field. Yeah, his involvement has increased uh, a lot since week one, even in the first couple of weeks. I forget uh, what the exact numbers were, but saw a tweet earlier where showing that he's really, you know, kind of grasping or, or coming into it and getting more involved as the, the week goes on. So that that's, that's a good pick as well. And now when it comes to actually picking this game, it's tough – because it seems like the Titans always win a handful of games that they shouldn't. Last year, remember, they beat Buffalo. They beat the breaks off Kansas City. They beat the Rams. But this year, I mean, they just don't They don't look good this year. So <laughs> Vegas only minus two seems seems low to me. Um, I'll take Vegas to cover. Like you said, I think the Derek Carr comes out and just puts on a show. Uh, they put up a lot of points. The total's hard to pick, too, I think. I'm going to lean I lean under, so I'll just I'll say under. But uh, I wouldn't necessarily be surprised to see it go just a few points over as well, being in the mid-40s. 
Yeah, I, I'd agree with you. I think the Raiders opened at minus one here and it's kind of got pushed. In. But I'd take the Raiders even at sort of minus three here. I just I don't think the Titans have anything on offense to push them. And if the Raiders, you know, uh, looking for a bounce back opportunity, this is the one. And the over under, yeah, I think I'd probably, probably just no, lean over. <laughs> Well, I think I sat there for this one and, and thought about it and kind of looked at it for, for a bit longer than I did any other game um, and said it went with the under, but wouldn't be surprised to see it go over either. Now, I mentioned Tennessee. You know, we said they always kind of win games. You don't expect them to, it seems like. So it could be opposite. A team that they didn't come close to beating last week, Buffalo, goes into Miami or down to Miami minus six. This game, 52 and a half point total, I think is tied for the highest of the week. Game of the weekend, I mean, it may not have been circled for a lot of people before the season started, but after the first couple of weeks, especially after that fourth quarter last week uh, for Miami, this has become the game of the weekend. We talked about Lamar having that huge game against Miami. I think it's really hard to bet against Josh Allen or Stephon Diggs having a big game really against anyone. Gabe Davis, I think I uh, saw before we jumped on here, uh, about 15 or 20 minutes before, was asked about his chances of playing or his confidence in playing, and he said 100%. So we know those players sometimes will say 100% and it mm-hmm. ended up being, being held out. We've seen it. J.K. Dobbins and Devonta Adams a, a couple years ago with the Saints wasn't too happy. But could be back, so it takes away some from Stephon Diggs, but still it's Stephon Diggs. They, him and Allen have had a great connection. Uh, I imagine they're worth paying up for, or would Allen and Gabe Davis be – a better play based on their cost or are so many people going to be on them that you have a a kind of have a a potential to shy away from them a little bit yeah um so quite often when a player plays on monday night DraftKings released the prices for them on sunday so DraftKings haven't really priced in just how dominant stefan diggs was on monday night football so he's currently 7700 which uh, just put it all up uh that will be in terms of wide receivers he is the one, two, three, four, fifth highest price receiver. So he's going to be popular because people are definitely on it. I'm not sure that the matchup is really as – well, it's definitely not as friendly as Tennessee. I think Miami gave up a lot of passing plays to the Ravens, but they do have good players. And I'm sure, you know, with a division rival, they're going to come in there with a plan. So I think he's completely fine as a player. I would expect a lot of people to be on him at that price. But it's just so easy to see Stefan Diggs putting up 20 points and not looking back. I think Gabe Davis is completely playable as well if he is healthy. And, you know, we've heard that he's going to be playing without any restrictions. Isaiah McKenzie and Jameson Crowder are just, they eat too much into each other's work at the minute. And until one of them separates, they're unplayable for me. And, um, Going to the other side, Vince Vince Verhey mentioned on our co-tracking show that we did yesterday, Buffalo was number one against the deep ball last year, and they are again so far this year through two weeks. Obviously, it's hard to follow up a six-touchdown performance against anyone, but this seems particularly tough for Tua. So are you playing Hill or Waddle despite the tough matchup? Or it seems um, a little risky given how good this Buffalo defense has been and it has been in, in the past against the deep ball and against these receivers. Yeah, I mean, one thing that really stood out for Miami was how well they, they were scheming things open and they were really... Mike McDaniel seems like a clever enough coach that he's not just going to roll out the same plays. He'll have worked out what kind of plays might stand a better chance against the Bills. So I'd be okay with it. I think if you're playing Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs, they're going to come with such high ownership that you need to do things that are going to be different to the field. And if the field is scared away from playing Tyree Kill or Jalen Waddle because of the reasons you said, then I'm all for taking that upside swing that playing one of them might end up with a big shootout like last week. I mean, nobody expected that. Last week, Lamar Jackson was under 5% owned. Mark Andrews was under 4% owned. And I think Jalen Waddle was under 7% owned. And it's like when... When you get those kind of ownership points, that's when the leverage really opens and you can play them. I think from a season-long fantasy perspective, all five of those guys, you've just got to start. I think two uh, is possibly a little more risky, but if you're feeling confident in him, then uh, roll the dice. Yeah, what about in that Miami backfield? We've seen the split. Week one, it was it was Edmonds. Week two was Mostert. Is it 
as simple as playing the cheaper option if you want part of the the backfield or are you kind of shying away from that at all just with the uncertainty there yeah so chase edmonds is 5100 which is very cheap for a running back on DraftKings, and raheem most is 4500 on DraftKings. so both of them are pretty close in salary it's just i mean we just saw derrick henry get absolutely shut down by the bills and i don't feel like you know he wasn't in a timeshare or anything like that I just would imagine that this is going to be another game where it's tricky for one of these running backs to really separate and see a lot of the work. And it's also kind of hard to get a read on how Miami are feeling about that backfield because Chase Edmonds was bad in week one, sent to the bench and they sent Raheem Mostert out there for the majority of the steps early against the Ravens before Chase Edmonds saw some play. So it's very tricky and I'd rather just fade that position. I think there's enough value on the slate that we can look elsewhere this week. Yeah, you kind of just have to hope, uh, like I said, stopping Derrick Henry, hope for a bunch of passes uh, to the running backs if you're going to play either of those guys, uh, which if you're expecting Buffalo to win big, uh, that could be the case. And speaking of opposite, this one's going to be opposite of what I said for Indianapolis. I'm going to ride with Buffalo until they prove otherwise, uh, whereas Indianapolis was going against them until they proved they can play football. <laughs> uh, I <think laughs> outside of the 79-yarder, Lamar had eight for 40 rushing last week. Uh Josh Allen is a different runner, obviously, but I do like his rushing prop at 38 and a half. Uh, he has 39 plus rush yards in four of eight games against Miami and then had 32 and 35 and two others. Last year, he went for 55 and 35. Um, so I, I, I like that taking a taking a, a, a jab or a, taking a shot. I guess, uh, if I can talk properly at the, over the 38 and a half. Um, he only had one game over 256 passing yards against them. Uh, but he's had at least two passing touchdowns in each. So if you want to take a chance maybe on the, the under, I, I forget. I looked at the passing total. I don't know where it's at. Um, but partially I do because he has run the ball so well against them and scored some rushing touchdowns. Mention this is the highest total of the week, 53 and a half. Uh, actually, I think it went up to 53 and a half uh, when I put it on here. It's either 52 or 53 and a half there. I like something similar to that week one game against the Rams where Buffalo scores a lot, but the total stays under. Um, that defense, I just think, is going to hold them. I don't think Miami is going to put up as as big of a, a total as they did last week. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think Bills to cover and the over hits just uh, – the under hits just barely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely going to be one to watch. I think everyone's going to be watching this one, uh, especially with the way Miami. So it's probably going to come out and be a defensive battle and someone's going to win 21 to, to, to 14. Miami's going to pull that one off or something. But uh, we're both going with Buffalo and, and the under there. So going to go from one potentially high-scoring game to another, and that's Detroit at Minnesota. Detroit six-point underdogs, 52-and-a-half point total. Really, I think, an exciting game here, especially from a fantasy perspective. It's been a slow start for Dalvin Cook. Yeah, I know that because he's he was uh, my first running back taken. Still no touchdowns. He did have a decent week in week one, had over 100 yards total. Kevin O'Connell said he needs to do a better job of getting Dalvin Cook the ball. I mean, I like him and I need him for fantasy to have a big game this week. As his cost dropped compared uh, to where he was or relative to some of those other big backs. So a lot of the big backs have started off slow. Uh, but has, has his dropped uh, due to the slow start? And are you targeting him this week? Yes, yeah, so Dalvin Cook's down at 7,900. He's kind of like, he's not dropped massively, but he's kind of dropped by a couple of hundred dollars since the start of the season. So that's, but equally, he seems to have been priced up because everyone knows that you can run on the Lions. I mean, they're just not a team who really go out of the, do a great job of stopping it. So, Dalvin Cook's definitely in play. I think he'll probably be slightly less owned than DeAndre. I'm sorry, slightly more owned than DeAndre Swift, which, if you ask me, is the better play in that game. I think you know the Lions are a really good team at rushing the ball. They're second in DVOA at the minute. Swift's the RB3 on the season, and he's been getting there incredibly efficiently. I think last week he had just seven touches, but still managed to rack up 16.7 points. Even though Jamal Williams is leading the league in red zone carries, Swift is still just getting there every week. So if I had to pick a running back, I think Delvin Cook would be more popular, but I prefer DeAndre Swift's side of things. And Dalvin Cook's receiving line set at just 17 and a half yards. Uh, which was kind of surprising. I figured it'd be a little bit more than that. Um, 
I, I do like them to get the ball in space a little bit more this week uh, and for him to go over that amount. He's got 18 and 19 in the first two games already. Detroit only 19th against passes to running backs. So that's a prop that I like in this this game, especially with that high total. Uh, I just think he's going to have a big week on the ground and through the air. And uh, you mentioned DeAndre Swift uh, in that offense. The Detroit offense is, is really fun. They're eighth in offensive DVA through two weeks. The last time they finished higher than 13th was 2012. That's when Matt Stafford threw for nearly 5,000 yards. He was just shy. Uh, Megatron's record-setting season with 1,964 yards. Uh, they had Michael LaShore uh, with over 1,000 yards, nine touchdowns, and then Joyke Bell added 899. So uh, I, I think we were, all remember those names. That was a, a good year for them. They were only 4-12 and 12 that year, but the offense was a lot of fun. And it seems like this year, you know, they're 1-1, they're one one, but – it's a lot of fun. You can get those historical stats by team as well as historical single game DVOAs by team and by week with an FO plus subscription. I've mentioned a couple times, only four ninety nine a month at footballoutsiders.com slash subscribe. And, and Tom outside of Deandre Swift, um, can you really, I guess I was going to ask what's your favorite play for Detroit, but outside of Swift, I think it's hard. You're not going to sit. I'm on Ross St. Brown in season long. And I would think, he's worth playing as well just with the the nature in daily with the nature of this game being so high scoring yeah definitely and he's only 7200 so it's really not you know he's not in that kind of cooper cup tier or stefan diggs tier just yet which is where his production is i mean that's where he's been performing every week and his ceiling is easily as high as most of the other receivers. I mean, Jared Goff threw for four touchdowns last week for the first time since 2018. And a big part of that is Eamon Rasain Brown just turning those throws into touchdowns at any point. I do think that because the Lions are first in neutral pass play, that it's got the chance to push the game into a faster pace, which is always good for more points. And we love that. Justin Jefferson... There's just no reason not to play him. So I think if you're playing DeAndre Swift, you can play the other side of this game as well, and you can play Justin Jefferson in the same lineup. I think the sneaky play that's kind of interesting, the Vikings are 30th against tight ends in DVOA. In DVOA. So if you felt like maybe TJ Hawkinson could get there, then he's only 4,200 on DraftKings, which feels like a real value. Um, I would expect people to gravitate towards that because of how cheap he is. Yeah, that Vikings defense has not been very good so far overall as well. And yeah, I picked Minnesota in our staff projections as the team favored by three or more points that's most likely to be upset. I do think Minnesota wins this, uh, but I think it's a high-scoring game. I think it comes down to the wire. Detroit covers, could very easily win, but I would pick Minnesota to win this. There is some value on the Detroit money line, though, at plus 215 at DraftKings and Bet Rivers, that was the, the best odds that I saw earlier on. And it, it, like I said, expecting this to come down to the wire with Detroit a good shot to win, I think there's value there. Yeah, and I, I agree with everything you said there. I've got the Lions to cover, but the Vikings to win. Yeah, and total-wise, um, I didn't have a, didn't really have a pick on this one. I would lean just ex- – a lot of points I could see both getting up close to 30 uh, in this one and, and taking the over at 52 and a half. Yep, no disagreement. Uh, a game going from the biggest, the highest total down to one of the lower totals. New Orleans minus three at Carolina, a, a divisional matchup, not really an exciting game. Uh, McCaffrey was efficient on the ground last week, but has just four catches in each game so far. I mean, that's good for running back in general, but that's well below McCaffrey's uh, standards if you, you drafted him. Are you fading him this week against a good New Orleans defense? I think it's it's a really tricky play because although we know his ceiling, he's still 8,800 on DraftKings, which, you know, that's right up there at the top. So if you're playing him, then you're probably not going to be at a play somebody like Justin Jefferson or, yeah, or Cooper Cup in matchups, which definitely are fine. So personally, I probably won't end up with a lot of Christian McCaffrey this week, but I don't feel like... The matchup is horrendous. I mean, the Saints have been good, but they've not been outstanding. Um, so I'm kind of fine with that. I think in general, I probably just won't play any of the Panthers. I think we all thought Baker Mayfield could be a bit of an upgrade on Sam Darnold this year, but he's just looked terrible. Um, Wig Martindale, the Giants defensive coordinator last week, was just sending pressure at him. And it's so predictable with Mayfield, the way he reacts to pressure. Like, 
you know, if you're not getting to him, then the defensive linemen just have to start jumping up in the air to bat the balls down. <laughs> or Mayfield rolls out to his left and panics and then is always game for an interception. So it's really difficult to trust any of that. Like, I love DJ Moore. I've got a lot of DJ Moore on season-long teams and in best ball. But I don't think I can start him this week. And the Panthers, I mean, they just don't have a particularly inspiring offense so far. Last week was the first time that... Uh, a wide receiver not named DJ Moore, She Smith, or Robbie Anderson actually ran a route. And that was Terrace Marshall who ran two. And it's like, they just, they've got no imagination. I think Matt Rule is going to be on the hot seat very soon. The Panthers got three home games, Saints, Cardinals, and Niners. And I'd be very surprised if he makes it to the end of that. Yeah, that, that may have been your tweet that I saw if you tweeted that because I mentioned that to Vince yesterday on the Coach Ranking Show because we had talking about Matt Rule on the hot seat and they, they've got those games that might not even make it to that point. So it's it's been rough uh, for Matt Rule so far. Now on the other side, I uh, believe Alvin Kamara should be back for this week from what I've seen. Um, I haven't seen anything saying that he's out yet or not likely to play. Are you playing him? He's going against the Carolina defense, ranked just 24th against the run, and and I think we're all expecting the Saints to win this game and, and run the ball. Uh, I think he's a fine play. I mean, he's 7,000, which is a good bit below Christian McCaffrey, and we know the kind of ceiling that Kamara has. But for me, it's kind of been worrying seeing Kamara's workload drop off in games where both him and Mark Ingram are active. Mm-hmm. And in week one, he definitely didn't look great. So I'm kind of in a wait and see mode on Kamara. I think the two players that I'd be more drawn to from the Saints uh, is Juwan Johnson, who is only 2,900, the tight end. But he's had a couple of really good games. I think he's seen the 13th most targets at tight end. And over the last two games, he's definitely moved ahead of Adam Troutman. The Panthers have been bad against tight ends. I think Daniel Bellinger got in and scored against him last weekend. So, yeah, I'd probably lean towards him as a kind of pump play if I was trying to get access to this game. And then, obviously, Chris Olave, who had the monster game last week with the huge amount of air yards. I think it was like over 300 air yards in one game. I think it was, or 365. <laughs> just, just, just I thought it was when I saw that at first. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, he's not, I think something like only 43% of his targets so far have been catchable, but it's really, you know, he's seen those high A dot targets and those are the kind of plays which if he catches one of them and takes it to the house, but that changes the game script instantly and it forces Carolina to have to become more aggressive. So he's only 4,500 and I'd definitely be fine playing him, but I'm just not ready to pay up for Kamara yet. Yeah, it's uh, – eventually, like I said, I think he's, he's expected to play, but he may come out again that he doesn't play this week. Maybe they hold him out since they shouldn't need him <laughs> this week. And this one is our high, second highest confidence spread pick of the week. Our projected line has New Orleans uh, favored by almost twice as much as the market. I agree with our pick taking New Orleans minus three here. Now, neither offense really has been very good. They're both 23rd or worse in DVOA. The defenses are nearly equal, actually, at 12th and 13th. Um, I will take the under again on a low total. And like I said, New Orleans to cover, I think, is a is a good bet. Yeah, I mean, I hate to keep agreeing with you, but I think you After know. After last week, you had to. We had some dissent quite a bit. <laughs> you actually were right on most of those. But I think, like, you know, this could be like 24 14. And, you know, obviously the Saints can easily cover. But yeah, that's it for me. It, I think it's a game which isn't going to be particularly pretty. And to it'll take us to one that should be pretty. Uh, Jacksonville plus seven like at the Chargers, 47 and a half. Could be a sneaky good game. Like you mentioned, uh, I think, in the Thursday night preview we did uh, when we were talking about tight ends, that this could be a high-scoring game here. Uh, 47 and a half points is the total. Jacksonville's second in DVOA so far. There's no opponent adjustments yet, but they're ninth in offense, third in defense after shutting out Indy. Should probably be 2-0. and They hurt themselves a lot in week one. Really uh, had a, a great shot to win that one. Chargers, on the other hand, are seventh in DVOA and should be 2-0. and A couple dropped interceptions, that bad pick six when Gerald Everett was asking to be taken out. I think this one, and I don't think anyone really disagree, or it's not really a, a surprise or a bold take, but it depends on how healthy Justin Herbert is. Are you targeting Justin Herbert or taking kind of a wait-and-see approach, especially with potentially no Keenan Allen again? Yeah, I think – I think a lot of people will be very much in that kind of wait and see approach on Justin Herbert. And because of the nature of his injury and because things didn't look particularly pretty at the end of that game against the Chiefs, 
I do think people will be scared off playing him, which means if you play in these really large field tournaments where you know there's thousands of entrants in them, then you can play against people's fears sometimes and find an edge. But because if Justin Herbert comes out there and he's actually fine and he's been practicing, he's not in any pain. Yeah. I don't know where you know where he's wearing the flak jacket or whatever underneath to protect his ribs. Then perhaps we do see a game where things develop into a shootout because these offenses have been fairly interesting so far. So I'd be completely fine playing Justin Herbert. He's seventy four hundred on DraftKings. I think Mike Williams, somebody who I really like this week, he's priced at 6,700, which for a player who put up 28.3 points last week just doesn't seem right. I think they're probably pricing him based on the fear around Justin Herbert. But Williams has shown us that he can be a true wide receiver one. So if Justin Herbert suits up and there's not negative reports coming out Sunday morning, then I'll definitely be playing both him and Mike Williams. Yeah, and speaking of... Looking like a number one or proving to be a number one. Christian Kirk has been the clear-cut number one in Jacksonville. Uh, but Evan Ingram was my favorite tight end pickup this week in season long. We talked about him in that Thursday night preview. The Chargers limited Travis Kelsey, we said, to five for 51. But he led the team in yards, and the Chargers were only 18th against tight ends. Is Ingram a good play in what should be a passing game, passing game script for Jacksonville, as you mentioned, that potential high shootout? Or are there still guys that you like better than Ingram? I mean, I definitely prefer the guy on the other side of the field, Gerald Everett. I think he's clearly developed into somebody who the Chargers want to use an awful lot. But Evan Ingram, through two games, he's seen 12 targets, which a uh, position where we're really scrapping around sometimes to try and find anyone who's playable. That's definitely noteworthy. I mean, last week he had a 26.7% target share, which is really right up there with what you experienced from like Mark Andrews and Travis Kelsey. I think in a game like this, I'd be fine playing Evan Ingram. I think you're going to get him very cheap on DraftKings. He is, let me just check. Uh, I think a lot of people would be drawn to Christian Kirk because he's been on a real tear. But Evan Ingram, he's only 3,700. So, yeah, he's very cheap. And if you're looking to stack this game heavily, then he's easily somebody that you can play. And it would give you some leverage off the amount of people who probably play Gerald Everett because... Gerald Everett feels like the slightly more reliable player there. Yeah, and it, that offense, like you said too, has, has looked good. Ingram, I think when I was writing up something about him, is on pace for over 100 targets. Uh, so a good pickup season long, potentially more than, than daily. But I, I like what I've seen from Lawrence, uh, Trevor Lawrence in that offense so far. The Chargers could run away with this. Their defense has been really good. But I would take – Jacksonville, I think, to cover as the biggest underdogs this week at plus seven. Uh, the Chargers, I still think, win this one. And I just I don't think that Jacksonville defense is good as the numbers say they are so far. Um, and like we've seen the Colts really struggling. They're just not playing good football right now. And I think it goes just goes over with a late touchdown uh, on on Sunday. What about you? Yeah, I mean, going back to kind of what you were saying there about Trevor Lawrence, I mean, Trevor Lawrence, this is this could be a real statement game for him. Like if the Jags go out to L.A. and keep this close, this could really be them saying, you know, last year was last year, but we're past it now. And, you know, this is the guy that we thought we drafted when we drafted Trevor Lawrence. I mean, last week he completed 83 percent of his passes and it was the second highest completion rate of the season behind only Josh Allen's week one performance. So. Things are definitely starting to click for him. I think the Jaguars are going to keep it close and cover. Uh, I think the over hits, but I think ultimately the Chargers just squeak a win. Yeah, again, we agree again. So I guess, I mean, good, good, kind of feel good when we agree. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll stay out west with the Rams minus three and a half at Arizona. This one's got a 48 and a half point total. Kyler pretty much willed his team to victory last week, scampering all over the field. But do you trust any Cardinals this week, even against the Rams defense, who has underperformed? They're number one against the rush, but overall, they've underperformed. Yeah, and I think, you know, I've kind of come on here a couple of times now and sort of mentioned about how I think that Marquise Brown was somebody whose ADP got too high in the draft season. And it's been clear now that Cliff Kingsbury just doesn't understand how to use him. This is a player who thrives off the deep threat, but Instead, all they're doing is they're pushing him out to the left side of the field in what they do with DeAndre Hopkins, and then they're barely targeting. 
him. He's, you know, his career average is 7.4 yards per target, and he's down to 6.9, sorry, 6.5 through two games this year. So they're using him much closer. And it's like, you spent a first round pick on him. If this was a first round rookie, we'd be saying, why aren't you using your rookie appropriately? So I think I'm definitely not playing Marquise Brown this week. Uh, I think he's going to really struggle against that pass defense. I think Greg Dorch is somebody who people have like cottoned on to what he's doing. You know, he's playing very similar to kind of like the Rondale Moore role of being very close, very low A dot around the line of scrimmage. And when Kyler Murray gets in trouble, it's a quick dump off pass to him. He's 4,300 on DraftKings. And I would expect he's being predicted quite low ownership at the minute, but I reckon that'll probably climb a little as the weekend goes on. But in general, this game feels like one which might end up turning into a bit of a slog and not scoring as many points as we'd hope. Uh, I think on the other side of the ball, Tyler Higby's definitely in play again. He leads the tight end position with targets with 20, and he's fifth in receiving yards with 110. The Cardinals so far have allowed Travis Kelsey and Darren Waller to combine for 43 PPR points. So that's the main plays. I think Alan Robinson is definitely interesting because he should have had a second touchdown last weekend. It was ruled out. So he's in play as well. I don't think you need to overly heavily attack this game. I feel like it'll be more popular than it ends up deserving. Yeah. And just, you know, this, it's a division battle. It could be, it's always, you know, a tough between the, those teams, but I like the Rams to cover in this one. Um, I, I've kind of looked at the history back. Kingsbury's Cardinals are one in six against the Rams. With every loss coming by at least seven points, they've allowed 29.2 points per game. They've given up 30 plus in five of seven. Two of the three last year went over 50 points. That playoff game totaled 45, and they're sitting at 48 and a half right now. Uh, I, you mentioned, it could be a bit of a slog. I'm going to go with the over just because the Rams have put up a lot of points against uh, Kingsbury's team, Kingsbury's Cardinals, and I do like the Rams to cover. I, just, I don't really like what I've seen from Arizona, even, you know, despite the comeback last week. They just don't look very good. Uh, like you said, the offense, uh, we know they've been kind of stagnant throughout uh, Kingsbury's tenure there. So I'll, I'll say I'm liking the Rams to cover and the over. So I think we will disagree there. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to take the under because I just think the Cardinals will be poor again. Uh, I think the, the Rams won't be pushed enough to get up into the 50s. So Rams win it. Rams cover under. Move on to an, a game that uh, is the closest of the week because it's a pick uh, This was, I think, Arizona, or Seattle minus two uh, early on. Uh, have there, yeah, it was Seattle minus two early yesterday and is now a pick Drake London, I mentioned, had a, a, a huge game last week back in Southern California where he went to college at USC. In that near comeback win, he had 12 for 86 and one touchdown. Went seven for seventy four in the opener. It, I, I'm wondering if he's a must start now in season long, and it's tough for me. I've got this problem personally in my home league, where I've got Cooper Cup, AJ Brown, Gabe Davis, Christian Kirk, and uh, Drake London, and we've got two wide receivers, two flex. Uh, so between you know, really trying to fit London, you don't want to bench London, but it's also I feel like I've got a good problem to have. So are are you putting Drake London in must start in season longs now? I think you've kind of got to, it seems like, you know, it's very hard to put that back in the bottle when you've seen a rookie start to come out like that. And it's very hard for Marcus Mariota as a quarterback to turn away from it. I do think that we're going to see Kyle Pitts more involved this week. I mean, we saw Arthur Smith after the game last week, so sort of ranting saying it's not fantasy football, but you spend a top four pick on a tight end. You've got to use him. And I think the Seahawks uh, a really exploitable defense for the Falcons to do that. Uh, the Seahawks ranked 26 in DVOA against tight ends. They let Ross Dwelly score a 38-yard touchdown on them last week. And in week one, Broncos tight ends combined for seven catches and 85 yards. So Kyle Pitts at 4,800 is somebody I'll definitely be playing on DFS sites. I do understand why people are ready to bench him in season long, but I'd probably just give it this week and see before you start taking drastic actions. Yeah, his reception line is set at three and a half, so I'm I'm feeling the over <clears> a little <throat> bit there, even though you said it's been a slow start, caught just two passes in each of the first two games. But uh, to your point, Arthur Smith said, you know, we're trying to win games. Well, 
You're 0-2 so far. And uh, I know you don't care about the fantasy stats, but we do. So I, I do think, agree with you, I think Cal Pitts uh, comes out. The Seattle defense is 30th overall against the pass. You mentioned 26 against tight ends. I think they get him, make it a priority to get him the ball. Uh, and he goes over that three-and-a-half reception line. I mentioned this has dropped to a pick from Seattle, minus two early Wednesday. Our projected uh, FO line was basically – a pick them. So go us. <laughs> I like Mariota better than Geno Smith. Atlanta and DVOA is better than Seattle. I'm going to go with the Falcons to win this one. As for the total, uh, ooh, I guess I'll say under because Seattle, you know, they've scored just seven points in non rust revenge games. So uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll, even though that, that San Francisco defense is better than Atlanta, I'll say under here. Uh, and again, like Atlanta to win. What's your pick? Uh, I'd probably go over. I feel like sometimes, you know, when you see two bad teams collide, it can just kind of sneak over. And that's when the coaches fool themselves into thinking that they're better than they actually are. I think the Falcons are going to win it, though, because, like you say, the Seahawks just they just don't look like a good team. And the Falcons don't look like a good team, but they at least look frisky. So I'll side with them. Yep. And now we've got a game with two – Basically, two teams with all-time great quarterbacks, but they both have wide receiver troubles. It's Green Bay plus one at Tampa Bay. Only 41-and-a-half point total in this one. Uh, Green Bay has got unproven wide receivers, and they've been emphasizing the run game. Tampa Bay may have no wide receivers with, it looks like, Julio Jones and Godwin both trending towards not playing. We know Mike Evans' suspension was upheld. Uh, they signed Cole Beasley. I don't know if he will play. Uh, is he worth taking a flyer on, like I said, I'm not sure if he's playing. Uh, I've highlighted him as a potential waiver wire pickup because they need someone to throw the ball to. Uh, Rashad Perriman, I think, is the better play there as the top guy. Russell Gage is still there. He hasn't really done a ton, I don't think. Um, on the other yeah. side, Sammy Watkins had a good game last week. I don't know. Are any of these receivers really worth playing to you? It's, it's a game where, generally, I'm not too sure I really want to target the receiving game. I think, you know, the Packers' defense is good enough against the pass that they could really, you know, when we're talking about Russell Gage, Bashar Perryman, and uh, Cole Beasley, I'm not sure that the Packers' defenders are going to be losing any sleep, really. If Julio Jones plays, I'd probably consider him at 5,600. Bashar Perryman at 3,900 always has a chance to unlock a game with a big passing touchdown. But Leonard Finette, somebody that I'd rather play in this one. I think week two was pretty disappointing for him. He only had 9.4 points against the Saints. But so far this season, he's out-touched Rashad White 51-10. to 10, And Buccaneers are going to need to rely on him here. At the Packers, we saw David Montgomery have a really good game running over them for a tune of 122 yards on just 15 attempts. So I think that's how I'll be playing this one is Leonard Finette. And what what are your your picks? I'll let you go first this time. I know if we agree, I'm the one agreeing with you, so you don't have to always be agreeing with me or make it, it doesn't seem that way. I went back and forth on this one a little bit because I think it's you know it's this game was a real headliner probably ten months ago, but things have just changed so much, yeah. and it feels like neither quarterback's really going to be particularly cheerful or enjoying it. But I've gone with the books to just squeeze by. Uh, I've gone. Neither, uh, so the books are minus three. I've got them to cover that, and then I'll take the books to win it. Yeah, so they, yeah, Tampa opened around, opened around minus three, down to minus one. Um, okay. Another really close one. Green Bay offense is actually sixth in DVOA so far. Uh, Tampa Bay defense is second. Um, I was, I'm like you. I went back and forth on this because it is so close. My heart says Green Bay. Since it's close, as a Packers fan, I'm going to go with Green Bay. I do think there's a lot of defense in this one. Uh, three of the four total games they've played, each of their two games have been 30 or less. Uh, the one that the other one was Green Bay Chicago was only 37. So I'll take the under, despite two great quarterbacks. Whatever the the uh, the total is set at for uh, Microsoft Surface launches, I'm going to take the over <laughs> between Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady. Uh, that, that one there might be more of those than touchdowns scored in this game. So I, I think that that it stays under and I'm going to side with Green Bay. But our FO spread and straight up picks are near the bottom in confidence ranks, which it kind of just goes to show you and me both say how close this is and tough to pick. And for those of you that are watching, you would have known those confidence picks if you had an FO Plus subscription. And you can get one of those for just $4.99 a month at footballoutsiders.com slash subscribe. Again, you have access to all of our NFL picks, premium articles, premium stats, uh, uh, weekly fantasy rankings, 
uh, as well as an ad-free experience on the Football Outsiders website. We've got just two games left. We'll try and go a little bit quicker through these games because they're really not super exciting, I don't think. Um, San Francisco minus one at Denver. This is a 45-point total. Another one-point spread uh, for this game. San Francisco dominated Seattle. Denver struggled yet again with Houston. But the big story in this one, obviously, is Jimmy G taking over for an injured Trey Lance. How does Garoppolo affect the value of guys like Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk? And even we've got the return of George Kittle as well, which affects things, I imagine. Yeah, I think it was interesting when Jimmy came into the game because he seemed to be playing in a much more kind of free way than we've seen him play at times with the Niners. And perhaps part of that came down to the fact that he was playing in a game game plan that wasn't planned for him. You know, Trey Lance is obviously a very different quarterback to him. But Jimmy G was letting it loose. Um, we saw Brandon Ayuk last year from weeks 10 to 18 across the end of the season. He averaged 13.2 PPR points, so I think you can definitely start Brandon Ayuk in season long. If you're playing DFS Showdown, I'd be fine playing him. I think if you took... Debo Samuel's ceiling is still very high because of the injuries at running back. We've seen the 49ers sign Marlon Mack and Tevin Coleman this week, this week, so it kind of tells you the state that things are in. George Kittle still sounds a little banged up, so I'm not sure I'd be starting him too, particularly. Uh, and then on the other side of the game, Cortland Sutton looks like a smash play, particularly if Jerry Judy misses out or if KJ Hamler's not returned from injury. I think if those two players do miss out, it might be worth a look at Albert O because, I mean, he got zero fantasy points last week, but tight end's a bit miserable. And if you're in a situation where you may be forced to, you can tell yourself a story where with those two missing, Okwu Gabunum actually puts up some points. Uh, but that's about it for me on that game. Yeah, we've talked about tight ends a lot, and you you answered the exact question I was going to ask you about. If Jerry Judy doesn't play, which he mispracticed yesterday, did Sutton would Sutton jump near the top of the wide receiver wide receiver plays and uh, you said it there just is in for a smash hit there especially if Judy doesn't play uh, as far as taking sides on this game Russ Russell Wilson is sixteen and four against San Francisco Shanahan is just two and eight against him but we know all those games were with Russell Wilson in Seattle overall they're very evenly matched Detroit is a ele- sorry Denver is eleventh overall in DVOA San Francisco twelfth. Denver 14th in offense against the San Francisco defense that's fourth. And then San Francisco 17th offense versus the Denver defense that's fifth. So very evenly matched. Again, obviously the offensive ranking there is one game of Trey Lance in a really bad situation and uh, what three quarters of a game with Jimmy Garoppolo. The FO picks has Denver as a half point favorite uh, against San Francisco in the market is a one point favorite. I'm going to go with that too inside with Denver. They're at home. I think they've got to figure it out at some point. It won't be pretty. I think it stays under 45 points, uh, but like Denver to win this one. Yeah, I, I'm going to agree with you there. I think, you know, traveling into the mile high, it's never really that easy. I think the Broncos, you know, they need a big performance after last week. They need to have, you know, the things in order after the fans were having to count down the clock for them and stuff. So I'm just going to side with that. I don't really have a strong feeling on it, but because the the 49ers are last in neutral pass rate. I'm going with the under as well. Yeah, and that's Sunday night. So last but certainly not least, or last but maybe least, uh, <laughs> Monday night is Dallas plus one against the Giants, 39-point total, second lowest total of the week. This line has dropped from the Giants minus three to just minus one. So under the radar wide receivers here, Noah Brown leads Dallas in receiving. Sterling Shepard had a team-high 10 targets last week. Uh, Michael Gallup, it looks like, will be back, but on limited snaps. Should we take a chance on him in those limited snaps? You know, it only takes one or two plays. And are either of Noah Brown or Sterling Shepard worth playing in this one? Uh, Noah Brown, somebody that I would definitely gravitate towards. I think, you know, we've seen that he's clearly got a rapport with Cooper Rush. Like last week, you know, he was targeting him on those high-value kind of boundary shots and just seemed to keep going back to him. And... Perhaps the Denver defense, uh, sorry, the Giants have tried to dedicate coverage to him to make it harder. I won't be playing Michael Gallup in his first game back. I think certain injuries, you just kind of want to see it before you believe it with players like that. You know, does he have the same speed? Is he able to go up for those jump balls in the same way? So, Noah Brown's definitely in play. Tony Pollard looked like somebody last week. He bounced back from a disappointing week one. He put up like 100 yards combined through the ground the receiving game. 
looked more efficient than Zeke, putting up 4.8 yards per carry to Zeke's 3.5, and he saw seven targets to Zeke's two. So Noah Brown, Tony Pollard, I'd be playing them. On the Giants side of things, I mean, it's just a mess really, isn't it? I think Saquon Barkley's definitely in play. If you're playing showdown, Captain Slates, you can look at Richie James and David Sills uh, as kind of nice pump plays. But Sterling Shepard seems to have fallen back into exactly where he's always been with Daniel Jones, where he's just that safety outlet in the slot, and he's just going to keep getting peppered with targets. And you mentioned Saquon. He had a quiet week last week after that huge game week one. Joe Mixon struggled against them, but uh, Saquon is kind of the focal point of that offense, so I would think he'd get a little bit more work uh, focus on on him uh, worth the play, like you said. Uh, mentioned the total in this one is the second lowest at 39s, at 39 points. I think it's an ugly, low scoring Monday night football game. Um, I don't think this one reaches the 39 points, and I'm actually going to ride with Dallas, the Dallas defense, and say the Cowboys uh, win this one as one point underdogs. I'm gonna I'm gonna side with the Giants. I think Brian Dable's got this Giants team looking more functional than in previous days. I think you know the Cowboys looked good against the Bengals with Cooper Rush, but I think it's one thing sort of like doing it one week and it's another kind of repeating that. So I'm gonna go with the Giants. I'm gonna go over. I think I saw it at forty, and I'll go over that and the Giants to cover as well. And last year you mentioned Cooper Rush. Last week it looked good, pretty good in one game. Last year, he looked good in the one game against Minnesota, but we only got to see him once. So now we'll get to see him a second time, see if he can follow that up. Well, that will do it for our week three preview. Before we go, again, don't forget you can get that free hundred dollars from Underdog Fantasy using promo code Outsiders, even in those states where traditional prop betting isn't available. They'll also match your deposit, uh, or they will match your deposit. Sorry, up to one hundred dollars again with promo code Outsiders. So make sure you take advantage of that for their pick 'em matchups as well as their battle royales. Also, don't forget to sign up for FO Plus at footballoutsiders.com slash subscribe for NFL betting picks. I've mentioned those throughout the show. Fantasy advice, premium stats and articles, and an ad-free experience. And then last but certainly not least, join us on that Football Outsiders Discord for in-game conversation for every game starting with the Thursday night football game throughout the day on Sunday and then Monday night as well. Enjoy the action. May your fantasy teams win. May all your bets hit. Uh, join us again next week. Tom and I will be here as usual every week covering the games. Tom, thank you for joining me. Enjoy the action. Cheers, man. Have a good one.